The Kansas City Chiefs are only the third team in National Football League history to make four Super Bowls in a five-year span. They are back, this time headed to Las Vegas, Nevada for Super Bowl 58. It's just that the path has been different, but the destination, the same. This Defending the Kingdom gets you ready for Super Bowl 58 and, of course, brought to you by Ticketmaster. This game is over, and you can doubt the Chiefs. You can dislike the Chiefs. You can disrespect the Chiefs. You're going to have to deal with the Chiefs being the AFC champions for the fourth time in five seasons. The Chiefs have the Lamar Hunt trophy, and they're taking it to Vegas for Super Bowl 58. Hi, everyone. I'm Mitch Holtis, voice of the Chiefs, along with senior team reporter Matt McMullen. Yep, we're sporting the AFC championship gear for one more week. And then we will dive into Vegas and get ready to try to win Super Bowl 58. This has been a fascinating season. Here the Chiefs are again. The Buffalo Bills of the early 90s. Remember, four straight Super Bowls. That had to be excruciatingly painful. Yeah, I can't even imagine to get a four straight and to not win one. Oh, my gosh. It's just torment. But then the uh, New England Patriots, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, winning three of those, winning in the uh, even-numbered years, 14, 16, and 18. And we know about the 18 trip, uh, beating Kansas City here uh, to win that AFC Championship game. Those are the only two teams, other than the Kansas City Chiefs, to go to four Super Bowls in five seasons, and the Chiefs are here again. But we will explore that this is a much different path than the Chiefs have taken before, but nonetheless, the destination is the same, the Super Bowl. Yeah, and just what a run. What a run this particular postseason has been to play in the fourth coldest game in NFL history. It feels like forever ago now, but against the Dolphins in the wild card round to win that game despite those conditions. Then to go to Buffalo as an underdog. And we were there. We felt that environment. Mm. You talk about Buffalo losing four straight Super Bowls. That is a city so hungry for their moment. The Chiefs go in there, and they win that game against Josh Allen and the Bills. And then this past weekend, they go to Baltimore, the number one seed. The Ravens had been so good all year, so dominant, just blowing out some of the best teams in the NFL. The Chiefs go into Baltimore and ruin their moment. They win that game, and, I mean, just to see the podium out there and the maybe 5,000 Chiefs fans in the stands, the rest of the stadium was empty, and to see Patrick Mahomes and Clark Hunt and – Uh, Travis Kelsey and Coach Reed hoist the Lamar Hunt Trophy again. It just doesn't get any better than that. So this run has been nothing short of remarkable. Now let's just go finish it in Vegas. And the run is a result, and we're going to explore this over the next several minutes. It's the result of a team that has been resilient and tough. Um, And I'll bring up a theory now, and hindsight here has proven it, But getting the three seed was actually a blessing. Uh, We'll jump into this as we go on. uh, But the fact that the toughness required to win, and you just laid it out, uh, Matt, perfectly, but to win minus 28 wind chill, winning at Buffalo, winning at Baltimore, is an amazing show of character and depth in this team and toughness to do what they did, and it makes them – Uh, battle-tested to win Super Bowl 58 against a good San Francisco team. We're going to spend more time looking at the 49ers in this matchup next week when Matt and I are in Las Vegas. We're going to actually bring you two defending the kingdoms uh, from Vegas, and then we'll do a complete dive and and swim the the entire 100 meters. Um, But this one is going to be more reflective of this path that the Chiefs have taken. And... uh, and it's different than the past the Chiefs have taken uh, to win Super Bowl 54 and win Super Bowl 57 and get to Super Bowl 55. Uh, but it's a path that, to me, has been one that is, in a way, more heroic. Uh, but it just, it just lifts this team, in my mind, from a historical perspective of what they've done and how they've done it. Yeah, just amazing stuff. It's kind of funny that... Looking back at how the run has gone, I'm almost glad that we were the three seed and had to go on the road and win these games because, in retrospect, it makes it all the more gratifying and epic. But going into the postseason, it's a tall task. And this is a shout-out to my buddy Thomas Chapman. Used to be an intern with the Chiefs, went and worked for the Steelers for a while. Now he works for NFL Online Media Guide, which is a godsend for us and every team in the NFL and many teams in other sports. He's like a stat nerd like we are. And this is his research. He let me know that, as far as he can tell, 
since the seating became uh, what it currently is in our current format, uh, I think since 1990, so since six teams in each conference made the postseason, the three seed has made the Super Bowl only twice before. It's hard when you're the three seed because you've had a really good season, but it means that if the chalk holds, you're going to have to go play the two seed and the one seed in their place after getting through the wild card game. And that's what we've done. And a lot of people did not believe that the Chiefs could do it. We believed. People watching this podcast believed. But you turn on sport talk radio, national sport talk radio, or national sports shows, a lot of people didn't think the Chiefs could do this. And to prove everyone wrong, and not just to prove them wrong, to prove them wrong with everything they've accomplished in the past as well, to be the defending champion and to say, you might have home field Buffalo, you might have home field Baltimore, but it still goes through us, even though we're on the road. I mean, that's the stuff of dynasties, right? That's the stuff of champions. And that's what we've seen here is the heart of a champion. Uh, it's just been so much fun to, to watch and follow along. This team has also debunked false narratives, and they've debunked the perception. The NFL is so much about perception. Uh, and I, it's, it's the way I started the broadcast in the Baltimore game was the fact that every game means so much. The league is so popular. But every NFL game is the equivalent of roughly 10 MLB games. I'm talking regular season here. And the equivalent of five NBA games or five NHL games. And that makes every week so important. But what that leads to, though, is overreaction Mondays or overreaction Tuesdays uh, and then some uh, recency bias. And those kind of sometimes become a recipe for some false narratives. What we were kind of trying to spew out, uh, including these defending the kingdoms, but everything that you and I do, was the fact that, yes, the Chiefs led the league in drops in the regular season. Yes, they had the most holding calls on offense. Yes, they were minus 11 in the giveaway takeaway. But even at the low point, they were still 9-6, and six, and they still ended up winning 11 games and won the division. So if that happened, what does that mean? That means there's this pillar that is there that's standing there in the winds that if the winds die down or if you dictate and clean up those areas where it's been a problem, you become a force even stronger than maybe before. And that's what we've seen happen. And it's also a marathon and not a sprint. Now, you don't want to lose three of five games. We all know that. We want to win every single game. But what do you learn from those experiences? The beauty of a regular season game is that the sun comes up tomorrow and you're going to play another team the following week. So when you lose a game, what happens? You learn from it. And it's kind of funny because after losses, we would talk about that and it might sound cliche or like coach speak or, you know, just trying to be super positive. It's real. What do you learn from a loss? Well, some teams learn nothing and they keep just going on making the same mistakes and they're they lose in the first round of the playoffs. This Chiefs team, particularly after the Christmas Day game, yep. like that changed everything. And Coach Reed even mentioned it during his media session on Monday. He said it was kind of a wake-up call. And what are you going to do after a performance like that? Are you going to say, ah, it's not our year? Or are you going to say, let's figure this out. Let's use what we have that is working and build on that and get rid of the stuff that isn't working. And from that Cincinnati game on, this team has been the best team in the NFL. And they've, all they've done is beat all the other really good teams in the NFL. They're going to face another one here in San Francisco. But I really believe the resolve and the mentality of this team is why we're in this moment. Because in the playoffs, everybody is good. Every team is good. The margins are so thin. So how do you make up in those margins and win these games? You're a little bit better because of what you learned from the difficult times in the season. And that's a testament to this team. Uh, and it makes this run maybe the sweetest one we've had so far. The NFL is so popular, people love to play fantasy football. Matt and I talk about it all the time. But reality football is, goes to higher magnitude in the playoffs. But psychological and mental toughness is such a part of, of making these kind of runs. And the Chiefs are precisely that. Now, we're going to get into it in a minute. So hold the thought, too, on that Raiders game on Christmas Day because that became – uh, the flipping game, actually, that Tuesday after that game became the flip that started this run. But first, let's go around the world. We're not leaving you out. Let's jump on your space station and, and uh, make a revolution. Yeah, what a cold open. We've been going for like 10 minutes or so. This is what <laughs> we do. This is Mitch and I. We'll just talk to each other for hours about this kind of stuff. We could go forever. Let's go around the world. I've got five today. Got a lot of submissions, but just five today so we can get back to talking about playoff football. First of all, shout five, out for five straight wins. Yes, five there straight we go. wins since the Raiders lost. Yes, sir. And let's make it six straight. Yeah. Shout out to Doug. So I go to trivia every week at a brewery 
here in town and uh, ran into Doug, who came over and said hi, talked about our keys to victory against the Ravens, and I have a feeling Doug is in a great mood here today. So shout out to you, Doug. Thanks for saying hi. Uh, shout out to Dane. So is this da- sports trivia or music trivia or anything Just trivia? general trivia. They have different categories. Does your week. wife go with you? Yeah. Yeah. She's probably a master at it. She's she? really good. I'm, I'm very so-so. I yeah. try to chime in. There's like 60 questions. There's uh, six rounds of 10 questions each. If I get like two or three, I'm feeling great. But you don't want to you don't want to feel really confident about an answer and, and tell your group, hey, this is what it's going to be, and then it's wrong, Ugh, oh, not good. Worst feeling, especially if Ellie thinks that it's something else, and I say no, it's this, and then she was right, not good, not good. So if she's Mahomes, who are you in this trivia thing? Um, let's see. I don't think I'm on the team. No, I think I'm probably an undrafted free agent. I was going to put you like Rashi Rice or. Justin no. Watson. She's, she's Mahomes. We have people that come along with us. You know, there's a Kelsey, there's a Rushy, <laughs> there's a Creed Humphrey. I'm the UDFA, gotcha. maybe bouncing between the practice squad and the roster. Okay. But hey, I'm part of the team. All right. Shout out to Dane. So Dane works here in stadium services and is working uh, at various events around the stadium. I saw him in the locker room club when we had media availability last week because the way that it works, media availability during a regular season week is just here in the practice facility, but there's more media that comes in prior to the AFC Championship game, so it's over at the stadium in the big press conference room. So he was helping escort people, and he said, hi, listen to all our stuff. Uh, so shout out to you, Dane. Thanks for introducing yourself. Uh, Chase is in Fairbanks, Alaska. Uh, so he's originally from Drexel, Missouri. Do you know where that is? Oh, yeah, for sure. Where's Drexel? It's uh, right on the Kansas-Missouri border, uh, straight across from Kansas like it's the uh, Prairie View High School. But it's it's uh, south of Harrisonville, but it's right on the border. So, All right. Yeah. Well, that's where Chase is from originally, now in Fairbanks. He's also a veteran of the military. Thank you for your service, Chase, and thanks Thank for listening you. to DTK and representing the kingdom up in Alaska. Mary Ann is from New Mexico, but originally— By the way, I, you know one of the things, bucket list? Sorry, yeah. I'm interrupted. But go ahead is to go to a UAF Nanooks basketball game. <laughs> yeah, that'd be awesome. University of Alaska Fairbank. We'll do this together. <laughs> Let's take the TK on the road and go to Fairbank. <laughs> they used to have a tournament called the uh, Top of the World Classic. Wow. Yeah, they, and, it got, and they had big teams. Remember, like the Maui Classic or whatever? And the University of Alaska Fairbanks hosted it. And it was a big deal around Thanksgiving. Now it's gone. But I'm just... I want to go to a Nanooks basketball game. Uh, hockey's also big up there, but UAF, yeah. baby. Shout out to the Nanooks of UAF. Totally Sorry. in. Let's get some some budget in here for that road trip up to uh, Fairbanks. I'm totally <laughs> in. Uh, Mary Ann is in New Mexico, but originally from Leewood. Uh, she went to school with Lynn Dawson's daughter, Lisa, Oh, way back in the day. Mary Ann's 70 years old. Just saw Lisa at Ed Buddy's funeral. Okay. All right. Well, such a small world. Yep. Uh, and she remembers when you started with the Chiefs all these years ago and, and has thanked you for all your years of service, bringing the kingdom alive to her. So shout out to you, Marianne. Uh, and then lastly, shout out to Bill in Cambodia. So we were talking about how our German fans have to stay up kind of late for games. And Bill says he doesn't really feel sorry for them because he was up at 3 a.m. watching <laughs> our game. Kickoff was at 3 a.m. in Cambodia. He has not missed a game in 20 years. That is dedication. So shout out to you, Bill. Thanks for representing the kingdom in Cambodia. That's awesome. Love that. That's all I got. Appreciate it. Well, that's a, that's a really good list. <laughs> um, so this episode, again, we're calling it um, The Path Has Been Different, But the Destination's the Same. And we're going to look at, uh, kind of run through these. There's four thes, the, 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 and the. And it's the defense, the heroes, uh, the unsung heroes, and then the depth. Uh, and it's really why we're here getting ready for Super Bowl 58. And let's jump into the defense. If I went to your trivia night and Ellie Mahomes is sitting there <laughs> and we played some word or number game and I just listed 6730-6073, what would the uh, answer be? And that would be the amount of second half points given up in eight consecutive games by the Kansas City Chiefs defense. That is two months And four of those eight games have been two games against the Bills, a game against Miami, and a game against the Ravens. Six, seven, three, zero, six, zero, seven, three. Wow. That's ridiculous. It's absolutely ridiculous. And you're right, against really good offenses. And during this playoff run, they've allowed a grand total of 10 points in the second half to those three teams. They shut out Miami in the second half, allowed a touchdown to Buffalo and a field goal. To Baltimore. Just incredible, incredible stuff from this defense. And let's talk specifically about the Ravens game. That Baltimore offense was the number four scoring offense in the NFL. 
there were times this year where they were legitimately unstoppable. And what did the Chiefs do? They held them to 10 points on 10 true possessions. Forced three turnovers, most turnovers the Ravens had in the game since week five, two three and outs. And this Ravens offense was the number one rushing offense in the NFL. They averaged 156 rushing yards per game. The week prior against Houston, they had like 250 rushing yards. How many rushing yards did they have against the Chiefs? 81. Now, a lot of Ravens fans got in my mentions, and they're like, well, we, we didn't run the ball. That's why we didn't have rushing yards. The defense dictates what you're going to do. <laughs> and the Chiefs' defense was saying, throw the ball. Let's see if you can throw the ball. And consistently, they were forcing the Ravens off the field. So the Chiefs' defense was just remarkable. Those 81 rushing yards was the lowest total for the Ravens in a game since week one of the 2022 season. That's a span of 36 games and here's one of my favorite stats from the game, which is just remarkable. And it's kind of a stat that goes hand in hand with the offense and the defense. It's time of possession, which can be misleading sometimes. I mean, the Chiefs for well, so think many about years. about our Bills game. That's, yeah. Yeah. Like, we had 43 snaps. They had 78. That's where it can be a little bit convoluted. But this one, not so much. Not so much. Yeah. Sometimes it doesn't really tell the full story. But this game, it does. The Chiefs outpossessed Baltimore by 15 minutes. The Baltimore Ravens, a team that wants to run the ball and grind you into dust and bully you, the Chiefs outpossessed them by 15 minutes. The Ravens had the ball for 22 minutes and 30 seconds. It was their lowest time of possession mark since 2014, Mm. a decade. Just unbelievable. The Ravens did not have the ball in this game. The Chiefs consistently had the football, and when the Ravens were on the field, more often than not, the Chiefs' defense was getting them off the field. So... Hats off to this defense. We saw the best defense in the NFL in this game, but it wasn't the defense everyone nationally thought it was. It wasn't the Ravens. It was the Kansas City Chiefs, the best defense in football. Yeah, can we talk about that now? It's the way I ended the game in Germany when you were sitting right by me. Can we talk about this Chiefs defense? That was way back in early November. And the three best defenses generally statistically, ironically, have been Kansas City, Baltimore, San Francisco. But the Chiefs have always been listed third in that. Okay, maybe we need to look at it differently. Now go back to how we opened the podcast when we said, all right, the Chiefs were sitting there at 9-6, and but one of the areas they struggled in, they just didn't take the ball away. They were minus 11, the Chiefs were near the bottom of the league in giveaway-takeaway at that point of the season. Well, what would happen if that flipped? Because it wouldn't be that crazy to think, oh, hey, it could flip. It has flipped in the postseason. The Chiefs are plus two. They have four takeaways. They took the ball away, as you mentioned, three times from the Ravens. They took it away with an interception against the Dolphins. So, And they have two red zone takeaways in that game against the Ravens. The punch out by Snead on Zay Flowers recovered by McDuffie. And the interception by Dion Bush, who hadn't had one since, what, 2001? Uh, 2021, sorry. No, he was, he was an infant then. <laughs> but 2021, when he had it in the end zone. And to get red zone zone takeaways and in the playoffs it counts like double because the psychological warfare that you get when you strip the ball from Zay Flowers pretty much wiped him out for the rest of the game and Lamar Jackson throwing that pick into triple coverage didn't do him any psychological favors either either this defense has been spectacular better than the other defenses that got Chiefs to Super Bowls that's why this path is different but those takeaways showed up and I'm and it's been outstanding That's why going into this game, I have a lot of respect for the Baltimore defense. They're really, really good. Historically good. You keep hearing that. They're historically – and they are. And they are. They are. But what I didn't quite understand is it didn't seem like people wanted to give the Chiefs defense credit for being just as good as the Baltimore defense is. And here's the thing. Baltimore allowed the fewest offensive points in the NFL. The Chiefs allowed the second fewest offensive points. The gap was 10 points. So the Ravens allowed 10 fewer offensive points than the Chiefs did. But the Ravens had 31 takeaways this year, led the NFL. That's really good. They had like 15 more takeaways than the Chiefs did defensively. I get it. That's great. But what does it mean? It means the Chiefs were on the field longer and allowed just 10 more points. So to me, I was like, I think the Chiefs defense might be better than the Baltimore defense because turnovers are kind of random. The turnovers come with variance. You can't count on turnovers. And what happens when all of a sudden, in a, in a vacuum, in a game like this, four quarters, the Chiefs defense is the one that forces the three turnovers. The Baltimore defense isn't able to. What happens in that game? Well, we saw the result. The Chiefs defense was the much better defense on Sunday night. The defense, first part of the different path, same destination. Now, the heroes would be kind of same path, same destination, but we need to mention them uh, because they've elevated their play even more so. 
I mean, Travis Kelsey before the game, I've never seen him so fired up to uh, play a single game than that game against Baltimore. I mean, it was the eyes of Zeus uh, looking at him. Like, he was not going to be stopped. And with 11 targets, 11 catches. But the fact that he is the all-time leading receiver in NFL history in the playoffs, taking out Jerry Rice, that's crazy. So we have to really think about this, okay? Say it one more time. He is the all-time reception leader in the playoffs in NFL history. We are watching Jerry Rice on the Chiefs. That's what he is. He actually has more catches than Jerry Rice in the postseason. Also, only three touchdowns shy of tying Jerry Rice for the most postseason touchdowns in NFL history. Also had his eighth 100-yard game in the playoffs. That tied Jerry Rice for the most 100-yard games in the playoffs in NFL history. 11 targets, 11 receptions in that game. He wasn't going to be denied. When the ball was thrown his way, he was catching the football. And think about, like, big moments, too. I mean, that great catch on fourth down to mm. extend the initial drive. Uh, the incredible touchdown grab against Kyle Hamilton, one of the best safeties in the NFL, had not allowed a touchdown all year to a tight end. The very first drive, they target Kyle Hamilton, and Trav makes an incredible catch. And let's be honest, Kyle Hamilton could not have covered that play any better. No, I mean, it was a perfectly thrown ball and a he perfectly wa- caught pass. He will watch that video all off season and go, what am I supposed to do there? <laughs> you can't do anything. And as I said on the radio uh, in the play-by-play call, Patrick basically took gray tape and just took that around <laughs> Kelsey's torso and just put the ball there and just, I mean, it, it was, man, of all the amazing plays we can talk about Kelsey and Mahomes together, that's top three. It's up there for Oof, sure. man. And also the acrobatic catch on third down yes. on the second drive. I mean, it's just one of those things, you're right, like he was so locked in that if the ball was thrown his way, he was catching it no matter what. And to have 11 catches on 11 targets for 116 yards and a touchdown, four of his 11 catches moved the chains on either third or fourth down. Just incredible. I mean, big-time players make big-time plays in big-time moments. And that's what we saw from Travis Kelsey. Incredible stuff. In Mahomes' path, same destination, part of the hero discussion here. Oh, wait a minute. Patrick Mahomes has never won a road playoff game. He's never played in one. Don't get me started. Super Bowl 55 was a road playoff game. It wasn't neutral like a normal Super Bowl. It just wasn't. Free tickets given away to people that were cooped up for five months coming out like shooting bottle rockets. Stop it. It was a road game. Okay. That being said, he goes to Buffalo and wins, goes to Baltimore and wins. And when you look at his numbers, it's stupid. This guy is 14-3 and three, uh, in the playoffs. The 14th win tied the career record of Peyton Manning, John Elway, and Terry Bradshaw. His, his AFC championship games, he's got 15 touchdowns and two picks, and his QB rating is like 1-1-2. In the AFC championship game, he has now, what, 38 touchdown passes, you know, 39 in the playoffs in his career with seven picks. He's gone two postseasons without a pick. But you know what? He's won two road games he sure in has. the playoffs. And now he's played 17 postseason games, right? And he has 38 touchdown passes. So he essentially has a full season <laughs> of postseason experience. And he's like has like an MVP caliber season in the playoffs. It's absolutely unbelievable. And think about what he did in this game. So 30 of 39 for 241 yards and a touchdown. And think about the efficiency. So the efficiency really stood out to me. When he took what was given and he had the razor's edge mentality to know Mm -hmm. here's where I have to push it a little bit and here's where we need to slow things down a little bit and I mentioned the time of possession earlier the first drive 10 plays showed a whole bunch of formations on that first drive credit to coach Reed coach Nagy the whole offensive staff and took the wind right out of the stadium and Peter Schrager talked about this on good morning football yesterday he was fired up because he was one of the few nationally to pick us to win and he's right like consistently the Baltimore crowd was getting super loud. Like, all right, it's third down. Get loud, everybody. Mahomes to Kelsey, first down. Like, yeah. all right, let's get loud. Here we go. Fourth down, Mahomes to Kelsey. Mahomes to Rice. Touchdown. You know, and second drive was the same thing. And second drive, 16 plays, ran nine minutes of clock. Touchdown, Isaiah Pacheco. I mean, just the wind was taken right out of that stadium because of the offense early. And then in the second half, I get they didn't score, and they want to score, obviously. But what's the positive of it? No mistakes. Didn't turn the ball over. And whenever they got the ball, 
more often than not, they ran clock off and then they played field position and said, all right, Baltimore, here you go. You have to start again from your 25 or that one drive where you're starting from your one. And consistently, Baltimore, they, they throw their hands up in the air like, what do we got to do? Just have to keep going back and trying and trying. And they kept making mistakes. And the Chiefs offense kept putting them behind the eight ball. So Patrick Mahomes in this game just laser focused, scored enough points to win, and then made sure that Baltimore's offense was consistently in bad situations the rest of the game. If you haven't seen it, uh, try to go to our uh, go to the app and find the uh, post game interview with him with Patrick because he really kind of lays this out. He said, "I wasn't going to take a chance, but part of your discussion was so well done about staying on the field and having the time of possession. It's getting the Ravens off, but staying on the field, and especially in the second half." And Patrick did that. Final hero to mention, uh, and then we're going to go into the unsung heroes. Uh, but is is Harrison Butker. I mean, he's got seven field goals in this postseason, but he hits a 52-yarder that tied his postseason career high and tied him with Adam Vinatieri, uh, who is thought to be the most heroic kicker probably in postseason history with all those kicks he made for the Patriots. But Butt just tied him with that fifth 50-plus-yard field goal. These aren't just made field goals. These are clutch made field goals. These are three-pointers at the end of the shot clock in basketball. That's the comp. And we need a big piece of like wood right here, right, to knock on wood because we don't want to jinx him, but just what a professional just comes in here and he's just automatic. He's just money. Hasn't missed an extra point all year. Think about like when a team scores a touchdown and everyone's excited and then you miss the extra point and everyone's like, ah, you know, like, well, yeah, I'm excited still, but that's a bummer. It hasn't happened all year with Harrison. And consistently when they trot him out there for a field goal attempt, no matter how far away it is, you feel really good that he's going to go out there and take care of business and just locked in. Doesn't let the crowd and Buffalo or Baltimore or the cold weather here in Kansas City for that Dolphins game get in the way. He's been perfect in the postseason. Let's keep that rolling here now into the Super Bowl. And we said it before, he was kicking fire hydrants in that Miami game. He put his leg on the line. Uh, these last two we're going to kind of lump together, and that's the unsung heroes and then the depth because these two kind of work hand in hand here as again this theme of our defending the kingdom this one as we have the so-called bye week uh, before Super Bowl 58 but the unsung heroes let's go back to what you said way before here about 15 20 minutes ago in this podcast about the days after the Raiders game the Chiefs lose on Christmas Day give Raiders credit they took the fight to the Chiefs and the Chiefs are nine and six they still have not wrapped up their eighth consecutive, the Chiefs wrapped up their eighth consecutive division title. It was the offensive line. All this discussion that we've been talking about, the genesis was the offensive line on the Tuesday after that game. They were embarrassed. Uh, the Raiders took the fight to them. And think about Creed Humphrey and Trey Smith and Joe Tooney and Donovan Smith and uh, Jawan Taylor and, and Nick Allegretti. And Nick Allegretti becomes one of the lead stories here on the Unsung Heroes. But we don't think about those guys. They said, we are taking the lead here. No more. The Chiefs have won five straight games, including this playoff run that we've talked about is unusual. And a big reason, maybe the main reason, for sure the starting point was the offensive line. And how good were they against the Ravens? Oh, my goodness. This Ravens defensive front is nasty. Like, mm -hmm. really, really good. You have Jadavion Clowney. you got Kyle Van Noy. You have Justin Matabike, who I think is the third best interior defensive lineman in the NFL at this point behind Aaron Donald and Chris Jones. You have 13 sacks this year as an interior defensive lineman. That was the assignment for Nick Allegretti. Go block Justin Matabike. And consistently, the offense was not in a bunch of negative situations. Mm. The Ravens defensive front got him a couple times. That's going to happen. But they did not wreck the game like they did against the Texans the week prior and wrecked so many offensive lines over the course of the season. This offensive line brought the fight to them. And I don't know if the Ravens were ready for that. The Ravens have been bullying people all year long. The Ravens really never trailed this season, hardly at all. I, I didn't verify this, but I saw their team reporter tweet this out, that they had not trailed by 10 points this season. I mean, they just bullied people the entire season. It, it began up front with their defensive line and their offensive line, and the Chiefs kind of flipped the script in this game. They said, we're here. We're the defending champions. We don't care that we're in your house. We don't care how good you were all year. We don't care that you led the NFL in sacks with 60. We're bringing the fight to you. That's a mentality thing. And, yeah, they've shown it here over the last several weeks. They definitely showed it on Sunday. 
in getting that Butker field goal of 52 yards to go up 17-7 at half. Big. It was a huge psychological uh, boost to the Chiefs and detriment uh, to the Ravens. We also saw the playoff experience. You and I talked about this too, is in, and people kind of buzzed this off. But the fact that the Chiefs roster now, uh, the roster that, that would go on the plane to go to Las Vegas to play Super Bowl 58 has a combined 353 playoff wins. Think about the rookies this year. So go down the line, Rice and Connor and others, Wanya Morris. And then you add in the last year's group, which set an NFL record for the most rookies on defense and special teams. They are a combined Last year's so, but so the sophomore class and freshman class of this team, fifty-eight wins and no losses <laughs> in the playoffs. What? Fifty-eight wins and no losses in the playoffs. That showed up in the Ravens game. So that's kind of the part of the unsung hero uh, depth on this team. I'm just going to quickly mention James Winchester is one. Don't overlook what he has done as a long snapper in tough conditions, brutal conditions, and he's been perfect or near perfect. Uh, we mentioned Alec Reddy. Mike Pinnell, uh, Turk Wharton on the defensive line with the loss of Naughty. Drew Tranquil, I'm going I'm to lead you into this one. Drew Tranquil. People think of, they have overlooked Leo Chennault in these play. He has been great all year. He's been even better in the playoffs. Uh, Dion Bush gets the interception. So the unsung heroes here of this playoff run also is in a testament uh, to the depth of this roster. So give Brett Veach and his folks credit for what they have done because we've seen it manifested in these three playoff wins. Do you know how many snaps defensively Deion Bush played on Sunday? I did not look at that. He played three. <laughs> he played three defensive snaps. He came in for Mike Edwards when Mike got hurt briefly on the drive that ended in Dion's interception. Came in for three snaps. His third snap was an interception in the end zone. That's an example of what you're talking about, yeah. that you have depth and you have experience and you have guys that can step in there. We talk about next man up. Is that just a cliche? No, it's real. Dion Bush goes in there and he picks off Lamar Jackson in the end zone mm. on his third defensive snap of the game. Another example of that is a player that played every single snap in Legereus Sneed. Mm -hmm. So let's talk about one of the most important sequences in the game. Legereus Sneed, he talked about it after the game. He got a little messed up on a deep route by Zay Flowers. Zay Flowers gets down the field, makes a huge play, uh, and Legereus was like, ah, that was on me, right? It would be so easy for a player to be thinking about how they're playing in the AFC Championship game, and they allowed a huge completion, like 50 yards, like, oh, man, like, are they going to get back into it? Like, is this my fault? Like, what could I have done differently? I'm, I'm thinking about that, right? Legereus Sneed didn't think about it. He moved on to the next play. And what happened? Just well, a few let's plays pause later. right there. To accentuate this matter, Zay Flowers, who's in his second playoff game of his life, uh -huh. decides I'll spin the ball on the face of, of Legereus Sneed and kind of and taunt him. Okay. That, lose 15 yards. And, but it just makes this whole scenario that you, I'm glad you're bringing it up. It just makes it more intense. It does. And Legereus doesn't take the bait. He just moves on to the next play. And what happens? Lamar hits Zay Flowers over the middle. Looks like a sure touchdown. He extends the ball. Legereus punches the ball out. Chiefs football. The Ravens go from being this close to a touchdown and pulling within three points to its Chiefs ball. And once again, what we talked about earlier, all right, the Chiefs are going to milk four minutes off the clock now, then pin you back at your own 25, and you have to start all over. I mean, it's demoralizing. And this Chiefs defense, like I talked about on Chiefs Rewind, they just defend every single blade of grass, and they move on to the next play like no defense in the league. They just move on. They're like, all right, you got us there, but you have to beat us now again, again, again. And it's so hard to do. And that's why this defense has been so good all year long. And for Legereus to do that in that moment, to me, to get back to your point, shows his postseason experience. He knows that he is only as good as the next play. It doesn't matter what just happened. You can make a play on this next snap and change everything. And he did. And – just an amazing punch out, right? I still, when it happened, I was like, because oh, we're in the stadium, it's hard to tell. I was like, oh man, he probably scored. It was probably after the fact. And you can see Lamar run over and he has his hands up and they slowly just go down when they play the replay. It's like, man, what a play. So hats off to Legereus, maybe the best corner in the NFL this year. And he proved it on that play. Again, a unique toughness in this team, a unique toughness in the 2023 24 Kansas City Chiefs. They will play four playoff games. That's never happened in, in Kansas City Chiefs history. And if you want to look at a parallel for this team to win 
at, that, that goes back to my final point I want to say and get your thought, and then we'll wrap it up. It was now hindsight a blessing for this team to have the three seed. Why? They got the week of rest against the Chargers. For, for Mahomes, it was a mental and emotional just back it up. Help Blaine Gabbert beat the Chargers. Oh, which they did, 13-12. to 12. That put a shot of adrenaline into the heart of this team. Kelsey to back up physically for the starters to basically rest and get rejuvenated. That's what the three C did. But then to go on the road and beat Buffalo, set them up to go on the road and beat Baltimore. And all these sequences of things happening and even having the guts to win the game in minus 30 wind chill. If you want to look in history at a Chiefs team that had to do the same, it was the first Super Bowl champion in Kansas City Chiefs history. They won. They made that path to Super Bowl four without a home game. They played in brutal cold to beat the Jets, who were the deal and the defending Super Bowl champions. And then they had to go win at the Raiders in a knockdown dragout against a team that had blown them out earlier before. Sound like the Bills? All right. That's what the Chiefs did to win Super Bowl four. That's the toughness of this 2023 Chiefs team. It's resiliency, and it's the heart of a champion. And a guy that we haven't talked about yet that I think epitomizes that is Marquez Valdez-Scantling. Good Mar- one. Marquez Valdez-Scantling this year heard it from a lot of people. And there were some games where he had an opportunity to make a play. Play wasn't made. Hmm. Again, it would be so easy as a human being to get down on yourself in that moment to, you know, not my year. Just move on. What did he do? Marquez Valdez-Scantling won the game. He sealed the game against the Ravens in the AFC Championship game and sent the Chiefs to the Super Bowl. It reminded me of Sky Moore last year in the AFC Championship game. It's poetic, truly. Think about what happened in the AFC Championship game last year. Sky Moore had the muffed punts, right? Well, he's the one that's back there to field the punt with a minute left against the Bengals. Gets a huge return, eventually sets up Harrison Butker's game-winning field goal. What happens here against the Ravens? Third and nine. A little over two minutes left. The Ravens are going to come after Patrick Mahomes. Zero blitz. If they can force an incompletion, they're going to get the ball before the two-minute warning and have a chance to go down and tie it. What does Patrick do? He trusts Marquez. He puts it up there and gives his guy a chance to make a play, and Marquez came through for him. That's the triumph of the human spirit right there. That's a guy that uh, went through some tough times this season, and he used that to make him better. And in the biggest moment of his career, the guy came through. And it's just you can't, you can't make it up because if it was a movie, it would be cheesy and not realistic. But it happened in real life. It happened in Baltimore. And we're going to the Super Bowl in part because of MVS. And that says a lot about who he is as a person and as a player. And MVS sets a record. Two playoff huge receptions on his butt cheeks. He did it last <laughs> week against or last week, last year against Cincinnati for the touchdown, right? On yep. his tush. Sure did. He does this one on his backside as well. Great one. Because it gives you an indication that this Kansas City Chiefs team is headed to Super Bowl 58. We'll have two defending the Kingdoms next week from Las Vegas. But we wanted to set you up because this has been a different path with the same destination. <laughs> 